to this webinar. I'm a professor of science and society at Arizona State University um, with the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes here in Washington, DC, and also the uh, editor of Issues in Science and Technology, a science policy magazine that's a partnership between Arizona State University and the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And um, throughout the COVID pandemic, uh, we've been running um, online essays uh, that are really attempts to get us to think in creative, interesting, and, and uh, generative ways about the pandemic, its meanings, uh, how to learn from it, what to do about it, and so on. Uh, and so that's what the subject of today's uh, webinar will be, but I'll get to that in one second. Just a few other background uh, uh, points. First is uh, if there's any media on the line, um, we're doing this with Chatham House Rules, so it's open, but if you want to quote uh, either uh, the speaker, Leah Gerber, or, uh, or anyone else uh, who asks a question, um, please go to them for attribution. Uh, second, if you want to ask a question, um, use the Q&A function, okay? And uh, we'll do our best to get through all the questions, although usually uh, we're not able to do that, but, but I'll try to at least um, cover all the major themes raised by the questions. So use the Q&A function for that. Uh, but if you want to just chat with the group of uh, participants, use the chat function and that uh, everyone will be able to see the chat function. Um, another thing to just emphasize is that these events are, we really mean them to be uh, participatory. When we can do them in the flesh, of course, it's easier to have um, uh, open conversations. But here, uh, we'll, we'll try to devote at least half of our time to Q&A uh, and conversation. And, and another important point is, although the title of this uh, webinar promises uh, that uh, Leah will solve all our problems for future pandemics, um, in fact, of course, uh, we're only at the beginning of starting to think about how to do that. And, and what Leah is offering is, is a, uh, a really important perspective on connecting uh, biodiversity, uh, uh, the potential of diseases for jumping from, from, uh, from animals to humans, and uh, other habits uh, and uh, social organizations related to sustainability and how to think about those in terms of the pandemic. So I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to Lee in a second, but just to say that she's a colleague of mine at ASU. She's a professor in the School of Life Sciences, but also the founder of the Center for Biodiversity Outcomes, uh, which is a super active, interesting group that uh, takes on big questions like these um, and then uh, tries to, uh, uh, really turn the science into something that 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 is valuable for policymakers, for citizens, um, and for others interested in these issues. So I will at this point, uh, Leah, turn it over to you, and uh, then I'll be back when it's time for Q and A. So thanks for being with us today, and thanks everyone for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Dan, um, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, looks like we have a great a great crowd, um, I, lots of familiar names. So. Hi friends, I hope everyone is well. Um, forgive me, this is my first webinar, so I'm gonna be trying to focus on the, the camera here. Um, and I also apologize that of course, right when we were starting, uh, my gardener showed up. So you'll, hopefully there's not too much background noise um, outside. Um, so um, as Dan said, I am a, I'm gonna just start, you all seeing the screen, the PowerPoint now? Yeah? Um, let's see. Yep, you're on, it's good, Leah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm a professor in the School of Life Sciences at ASU. And as Dan said, uh, I also direct our Center for Biodiversity Outcomes. I have to thank Dan for the outcomes part of our, our name, um, stole it from CSPO. Um, and thank you uh, particularly to Dan for his uh, support and insight in the early inception of the center, which again aims to um, integrate scholarship from across campus to support innovation in the field of biodiversity conservation, and then link that innovation to decision-making on the ground across sectors uh, ranging from government, NGO, and private sectors. So we do a lot of collaborative work outside of the ivory tower. Um, so as you all know, we're in this crisis, this, this pandemic, uh, 
Um, and what I want to do today is to um, present and summarize the relevance of uh, biodiversity management in preparing and mitigating for uh, future, future pandemics. And then I want to sort of have a discussion about um, some of the suggestions that I'm going to present to you on what we should do. Um, and I'm looking to you, to you for discussion and insight on, on this. All right. Okay, so what does biodiversity have to do with, um, with COVID? Well, <clears throat> Just a refresh, bio, what is biodiversity? So biodiversity is the range, it, it occurs at multiple scales. So imagine an ecosystem. So we have genetic diversity, um, which is variability among genes. We also have species diversity, and then we have community and ecosystem diversity. So when we talk about biodiversity, we're talking about nature, not just individual species, but how communities function together, uh, the compilation of genes and species within an ecosystem. So <clears throat> a refresh on what the threats are to biodiversity. The primary threats to biodiversity are habitat loss, introduced species, overharvest, pollution, and climate change. And the recent uh, IPBES, Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, report that for which I was a lead author uh, we produced last year, uh, <clears throat> land use change or habitat loss is the primary driver of biodiversity loss. So let's keep this in, in mind as we start talking about what caused COVID and what factors make us more vulnerable to pandemics. Um, so first of all, these are sort of just some, stepping you through some logic here. The threats, uh, these threats that I've listed here, known as the evil quartet in conservation science. Uh, these threats make biodiversity more vulnerable to infectious disease. And not just biodiversity, uh, as we've seen, more vulnerable, but also um, people. So I've studied the interaction between conservation and um, disease, mostly from a standpoint of what what can the impacts of novel infectious diseases be on wildlife populations um, with less attention to the impacts on humans. But what I'm gonna talk about today is the feedbacks between um, impacts on wildlife and people. So in short, um, degrading biodiversity brings people into contact with novel pathogens and um, Okay, just one sec here. So when we degrade biodiversity, this increases the risk of uh, zono zoonosis. And is to remind you, zoonos a zono zoonotic disease um, is any disease that can be transmitted from an animal to humans, either directly or through an intermediate host. And this is what we experienced with the COVID. Um, pandemic. Um, as you may have read, um, the thought, the, the best data suggests that the pandemic uh, emerged in a wet market in Wuhan, China, either through um, a direct transmission through an, a bat species or possibly hopping through an endangered species known as the pangolin. Regardless of the source, it is a wildlife disease that has made its way into um, into humans and is is causing a lot of a lot of um, crises globally. Okay, so I mentioned the IPES uh, global assessment, uh, which we produced last year. One of the findings of this is that um, across taxonomic groups, this is a um, figure showing the cumulative number of species that have been driven to extinction by, by people um, across time. And we see that in general, uh, more species of plants and animals are threatened with extinction now than any other time in history. And these rates of extinction are increasing. 
in, in recent years. So this is um, something that we in conservation and, and me as the director of a center on biodiversity, you know, this is what I focus on. Um, and when the COVID virus hit, I thought, well, maybe this might be a way to reach people because we're seeing impacts on us. It's not just altruistic and those poor animals. Um, so um, when, when we look at the planet and we think about um, biodiversity, um, there really is no pristine place left on the planet. Uh, this is a, a map showing the, the human footprint, both in, on land and in the ocean. And essentially, there's really no place that's not touched by humans. Um, this, this is of concern when we think about COVID, given what I just said, that uh, as, as humans encroach into these habitats and transform land, uh, we are risking the transmission of, of novel pathogens. Um, so you may have heard of the term the Anthropocene. Uh, there have been five mass extinctions on Earth. And recently, the data suggests that we are actually in a sixth mass extinction that is specifically caused by humans. And so these are just, this is a nice, nice schematic that um, shows the uh, rates of decline uh, for different taxonomic groups, ranging from birds to mammals to amphibians, and just showing this stark rate of extinction. So some may argue that, um, or, or suggest extinction is natural. It absolutely is but the rate of human-caused extinctions is not, is not natural, it's anthropogenic, and that's what's known as the Anthropocene. So what happens when we have a pandemic in the Anthropocene? Well, um, you know, the, the, the same factors that have put biodiversity at risk, habitat destruction largely, and uh, to the lesser extent wildlife trade, make us vulnerable to pandemics. So a lot of the media attention uh, when COVID hit was uh, focused on the wet market, it, when the problem is much bigger. It, it circles around all of those threats to biodiversity, and namely habitat destruction, which is the largest, the most significant um, driver of biodiversity loss. So as we encroach into these habitats, we're coming into contact with novel diseases, and that increases our risk of exposure and future pandemics. <clears throat> this is not new. Um, as I mentioned, uh, zoonotic disease can be transmitted from animals to humans. The COVID virus um, is a, uh, from the, the, the SARS COVID-2 um, category, and there have been a number of other emerging infectious diseases that have had dramatic effects on, on humans. Um, overall, when we look at human mortality, Emerging diseases cause about 30% of mortality globally, and wildlife serve as the origin for the majority. 75% uh, is, the, is the estimate of these zoonotic diseases. So this is not new. Um, so why did we let this happen? How did this happen? <clears throat> Before I answer that, I'm just going to give you some more evidence about um, data, there, there are signi there's significant research and data available that substantiates the, uh, my assertion that biodiversity loss makes us more vulnerable to disease transmission. And these are just a few examples, ranging from coral um, bleaching, uh, hantavirus, West Nile virus. These are all examples of uh, biodiversity loss making us more vulnerable to disease transmission. So we have good evidence. We, we, it, it, what happened with the coronavirus outbreak is not new. <clears throat> and in fact, um, and I, I think this is a paper published in um, 2010 on the links between biodiversity loss and uh, the risk of infectious disease. And what we see here is that the same drivers, land use change, agricultural intensification, um, bushmeat, uh, et cetera, these are the primary 
um, drivers of not only biodiversity loss, but this figure is about zoonotic diseases. So, so there's something here, right? We, the same drivers are causing both biodiversity loss and zoonotic diseases. So maybe, maybe we could design strategies that, that tackle both. Or maybe we have, maybe finally with all of my arm waving about how important biodiversity is, I now have a platform because it's impacting humans, the loss of biodiversity. Um, again, to just kind of uh, elaborate a little bit of what the, the risks of emerging zoonosis are for humans. So this is a, um, a figure showing areas of high risk for jumping, the zoonosis jumping from wildlife to humans. And those areas are um, typically areas of high mammal diversity. And those tend to be tropical forests that are subject to high land use change. Um, in short, um, to make this very clear, human encroachment into wildlife habitats is bringing people into contact with the diversity of novel, novel pathogens. So those pathogens are there and, uh, you know, uh, the majority of the time, these pathogens are not jumping and manifesting in humans. But there are those cases where, where they do jump. Um, they're not maybe pathogenic to other species, but they are to humans. So what do we do about this? And here's where I start arm waving and speculating. And I'll hope we'll have, I hope we'll have a, um, an insightful discussion about this um, and hopefully can continue this, this conversation. So what do I think that we need to do? Well, um, many of these suggestions are not new. We need to pay careful attention to limiting uh, wildlife human interactions. Uh, we need to protect and restore wildlife habitat. I really apologize that my dog is barking in the background. I hope you all can't hear that, but uh, it's slightly distracting here. Um, also, early warning systems and um, pre better preparing for, the, for pandemics because there will be additional pandemics. Um, and so what I propose is that we need a, uh, a global governing body that um, is able to uh, predict and manage these underlying drivers of zoonotic diseases. All right, so what I, I, you know, sort of arbitrarily in this, this webinar um, is based on the short piece that, um, that Dan mentioned that was published in um, the web, on the website for Issues in Science and Technology um, Policy, I think. And um, I made up a name called the Zoonotic Disease Commission. Um, this could be called anything. And I want to talk about what existing regulatory agencies um, and international bodies, to what extent these bodies um, already tackle these things. And, and do we need a new body or um, can we um, work to um, improve the uh, attributes of existing bodies so that they can tackle these things? So the things that I think um, such a body could provide, um, you know, I just gave you a quick, a, a quick recap of how biodiversity loss impacts our um, uh, exposure or the risk of pandemics. We could have predicted this and we could have taken action. Uh, where did we fail? Um, I, I argue that a, a repository of data on past pandemics, um, what the risks are um, that is widely available that people can use um, and is um, disseminated uh, to tailored for different audiences is first and foremost like we need to get the science um, out there and I don't think we're doing a good enough job I think having such science out there will allow for evidence-based decision making uh, which ultimately is going to minimize our risk if we're taking action based on data. 
Um, as you may know, many um, uh, international uh, agreements are non-binding. And so that's really the challenge because what I'm calling for is a global, global cooperation. <laughs> Um, and, and, and global cooperation that actually has regulatory clout. Um, I'm going to talk more about this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to step through each of these. These are my three recommendations. And then finally, I think we need to think about um, transformative change in our economic system. And this is the, the final chapter of the IFES report, chapter six, after we reviewed the, the data on biodiversity and ecosystem services for the entire world. The conclusion was that biodiversity is being lost at an unprecedented rate. And to, to uh, address this, we need fundamental transformational change in our economic systems, because we're not accounting for nature in, in our current economic systems. Um, there are some, there is some work out there um, that I think poses uh, promise, um, specifically around market-based approaches and incentives to um, cooperate. <clears throat> so um, to recap what I said about um, support for basic science. So I'm, I'm saying that we can do better with uh, providing an evidence base that allows us to um, make assessments and predictions on the risks of disease outbreaks and the potential consequences of different actions. So what, what interventions or activities are we going to take um, and what are the risks? So this could be a decision tool. This could be an evidence base from which uh, different sectors of society could query to, to make their own inference. Um, we also need um, some oversight of what these data, you know, what the data are, are the data legitimate? Um, and um, so that uh, the data can inform decisions across scales and sectors. And ultimately, um, you know, this is something that I've chatted with Dan about over the years and that, you know, better science makes better decisions. We, we can talk more about that. Um, but that, that's what I'm arguing that if we have better information, we can make better decisions. I, I look forward to chatting about that. I think that Dan uh, has a paper saying how science makes policy worse. Um, okay, so the second thing that I call for is a global governance regime with regulatory clout. Um, you know, I've worked quite a bit with um, the International Whaling Commission and one of the challenges there is that um, there's no, it's, an, it's a non-binding agreement. And so there's no um, mechanism to implement these agreements. And that's problematic. Uh, I don't know that I have the answer, except that I think we need to think creatively about incentives and market-based approaches to um, encourage um, compliance uh, and, um, potentially think about uh, modest enforcement uh, mechanisms, as I say here. So I think we need political buy-in <laughs> with a small number of, of participant uh, leading nations, um, the transparency, and um, like I said, some modest enforcement mechanisms. So I, I promise that I would be arm-waving here. Um, okay, so then I, I've talked about market-based incentives you know, I think we, we can't forget that a large fraction of the human population relies on land use and extractive, exploitative use of nature for their well-being. I've seen a number of articles describing um, the increased risks to biodiversity it, it, since COVID because a lot of livelihoods are under, under pressure uh, many, many local communities across the globe rely on um, tourism, for example, and there's no tourism. And so where does their revenue come from? So we really need to think about property rights, I think. This is, this is one idea uh, in terms of thinking about market-based solutions and transforming the global economy to provide alternative livelihoods that are economically feasible 
and so that local communities actually have a stake uh, in conservation of, of those resources. Um, <clears throat> also, I think in, in um, developed countries, we, we need to think a lot more about um, incentivizing both sustainable production and also sustainable consumption. Um, I, I, I'm not even really touching on what people can do. This, this, the, top, the topic of today's discussion is very much on international governance. Clearly, there's a lot that we can do as individuals in our consumption patterns to, um, to, to have an impact on biodiversity loss, curbing biodiversity loss, and also um, the risk of pandemics. So by encouraging sustainable consumption. <clears throat> so what a couple of ideas and examples of that, you know, we, you, we have used the idea, the concept of cap and trade for carbon. That idea has um, also been uh, proposed in and under discussion in, in wildlife. So the idea is that we set a quota for, for harvesting um, and the, the individual quote shares can be traded. So there's an actual incentive to conserve the stock. Um, certification and eco labels are also a promising approach, particularly in say fisheries and coffee. And then depth swats for conservation of land is, is another idea. There are probably many more. I'm uh, just listing a few here. Okay, so I'm arm waving about what this new ZDC uh, should do. Um, what, what existing uh, institutions are out there that are already um, in, in place and that could, um, could be positioned to um, address these issues? I know uh, from the participant list, we have representation from many of these organizations, so I'm, I'm very curious uh, to, to hear thoughts on how, how these organizations and institutions might work together and or bring in some of the ideas that I proposed related to the D CDC. So um, these are some quotes on the, um, the uh, missions associated with the World Health Organization, uh, the USAID PREDICT program, um, the One Health um, Coalition, and the uh, Convention on Biodiversity. <clears throat> so I'm going to just run through these real quick uh, to, to let you know what, what I have learned uh, from, from looking into these organizations and what they're doing to minimize risk of pandemics and also to um, particularly address the uh, recommendations that, that I made for a new CDC. So this uh, WHO Convention of Biodiversity Program on Biodiversity and Health aims to support collaboration, raise awareness, um, provide support to the broader international community, um, support integration between biodiversity and health sciences. Uh, the USAID PREDICT uh, program um, is aims at developing capacity to identify viruses with uh, potential zoonotic uh, potential and to support uh, surveillance and research, laboratory research, um, aimed at min minimizing this risk. There's also the One Health CDC uh, partnership um, that aims to promote solu joint solutions for countries facing zoonotic disease threats, uh, work with local communities on education, um, support international cooperation to understand the spread of infectious disease, and um, it, you know partakes in um, emergencies and um, engaging around the world on the ground and on responding to those emergencies. So that's a, a quick nutshell. I'm sure I left a lot out for those of you who are with these organizations. Uh, what I try to do, and uh, please tell me where I'm wrong and which organizations, uh, institutions I'm, I'm missing here. But as you recall, I listed um, 
you know, the three recommendations are, you know, better science and better communi tailored communication, governance, um, and market-based solutions. This is my inference on what, you know, all, all of them are good with providing data. Um, it doesn't seem that governance is really addressed. And, you know, I have talked to a few environmental lawyers and, you know, there's, this is really a wicked problem when we have um, non-binding global agreements. Like how, how do we work together? Um, how, how do we promote that? Um, and that's something that I don't see in any of the existing institutions. And then uh, I, I'm not seeing any discussion about uh, incentives or market-based solutions within these institutions. So um, what I wanted to sort of end with, and I'm going to allow plenty of time for conversation, um, you know, I, wanna, I want to really emphasize that this is the first of a, this conversation, and, you know, I don't expect that I personally have the solution, but these are just some of the relevant things that I think we need to start thinking about as research institutions and policy institutions. Um, I'm reminding, just putting up this reminder about, uh, that came out of the FS report, that we need transformative change in our economic systems to both protect biodiversity and to ameliorate the risk of future pandemics. Now, the cost of doing that this of you know organizing ourselves to create such a regulatory such a governing body that the cost is tiny compared to the global cost of responding to the pandemic um, what we need though is a sustained commitment to cooperation among these institutions and among communities across the world so um, you know I've been having a lot of conversations with my teams, my, my staff and my grad students about how, um, what we do as academic and research scientists seems so inconsequential given what's happening to the world. And I like to remind myself of the, you know, the Gandhi quote that um, whatever we do may seem insignificant, but it's important that we keep doing it. And so I also want to urge us and encourage us to keep thinking and keep plugging away at this, even if it seems insignificant. Um, and I think that's all I have. Um, and I guess now we transition to, to questions. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Th thank you, Leah. Um, and uh, we've already got a bunch of questions. Uh, and as, as you said, this is a big, wicked problem. Um, and the kinds of questions that we're getting uh, point to various dimensions of, of that wickedness. Um, so I, I'm gonna start with one that challenges me on a very particular um, issue, which is it's from uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Leah Kaplan, and keeping the Leahs and the Leahs straight is extremely difficult for me, but I think I've got it right. Um, so so uh, Leah notes that, um, uh, that we have a bunch of organizations right now that should have been well positioned to, to prepare us uh, for and allow us to do a better job uh, responding to, to COVID. Uh, so her question is, is how, would, um, how would ZDC uh, do better? What are the ways that, that it would um, allow us uh, in the future to do better than our existing capabilities uh, did, especially given that we we're expecting something like this at some point. That's a really great question. And to be honest, I'm not sure I have the answer. I, from what I presented, I, I infer that, you know, the existing organizations do a pretty good job at um, providing, bringing data together. Um, but not in um, addressing these governance issues and these issues associated with how do we get international um, institutions to work together and bring in these market-based approaches. So, so, Someone can tell me if I'm wrong, though. Well, so that makes, bring, takes me to another question. This is from Brian Wee. Um, what about CITES? Uh, is CITES not appropriate for, uh, which is Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species and Wild Fauna and Flora, uh, 
is is that why would that not be appropriate and was thank you so much in fact that was one of the um the institutions that we did you know ha i had on a list earlier and i just tried to simplify it to focus on the ones that i thought were most relevant but cites is absolutely um relevant especially for particularly when we're talking about trade so there have been a number of calls to uh, ban wildlife trade um I, I think, you know, to a certain extent, when you look at the threats to biodiversity, one of them is over harvest, over exploitation. For that threat, CITES is relevant because the, the, the particular, um, the, the law, the, the agreement is particularly pertains to trade. Now I'll comment on the side that I'm quite skeptical about um, how uh, complete bans will perform. We, we have no evidence that bans work. And so that's where I'm thinking that are, are proposing that market-based, incentive-based um, solutions are offer more promise. Or at least we should explore these because we really don't have evidence that we've been able to manage trade through bans. Okay, so, so wanting to make this as much of a discussion as possible, I'm going to jump around on the questions here and follow up with one from Zach Smith. Uh, who says that the IPBES report calls for transformative change, but do market-based mechanisms really count as transformative change? And uh, do we have good evidence that they work? That is such a good question. Um, so I was part of the chapter, the lead author group for the, the final chapter of the IPBES report. And, um, you know, there's a there's a lot. What we what we spelled out in the report is a lot about um, what changes are needed, but the IPES report doesn't say how how do we go about making these changes. Um, I don't know that market based approaches uh, are are the right you know motivation or approach to making the changes that are needed, for example, sustainable consumption patterns. But given how our, our economy works, um, this, is, this is a hypothesis that I think ha holds a lot of teeth. Um, you know, an example of this is um, in our uh, accounting systems for uh, you know, commodities that are traded in markets, we do not account for the value of natural capital. So it's, it's free. So if we can figure out how to uh, incorporate the value of nature into these these markets then then we see transformative change again this is uh, there's no evidence I think we were starting to see it and I would argue that the corporate sector is really leading us in a transition towards sustainability given given the current govern government um, particularly in the US so, so Zach Smith has followed up and asked don't don't uh, haven't whaling bans worked Ooh, that's a can of worms. Um, okay. No, they have not actually. They have not worked. Is the short answer. Um, and in fact, that's that's something that I have worked on, particularly proposing this idea of a market where uh, we right now, you know, the International Whaling Commission calls for a complete moratorium, and um, with with some exemptions for quote scientific whaling. Um, now scientific whaling, whaling occurs that's called scientific, that's actually for consumption or, or is commercial. Um, so what happens is that the scientific whaling is happening at an unsustainable rate. Um, so I like to call things as they are and say we are whaling. So let's, let's look at what's happening and set a sustainable quota and then set up a market such that that quota can never be exceeded and um, you know, you could the, the seller, the whalers can actually sell, uh, you know, shares of whales to the conservationists. So then, the conservationists have a clear mechanism of um, investing in something tangible, as opposed to I'm giving money to these organizations and I don't really know what's happening. I'm actually buying a whale share. So thanks for bringing that up because I think it's a, a great example. Okay, um, several different ways this could go, but I think um, s some of the people listening now may have listened in 
uh, to our recent um, podcast uh, by Merlin Tuttle, uh, who's a defender of bats and believes that the evidence uh, that they're the cause of, of COVID is actually weak. But that's not the point I want to make um, in, in, on behalf of one of these uh, questions. Uh, it's more his emphasis on um, how widespread uh, uh, viruses of unknown character are among wildlife. And so we have a question from Ajay Batla, and I'm sorry if I wrecked your name. Um, is there any ongoing initiative that catalogs pathogens by species uh, that are potentially dangerous? Um, and is there any reason to think that, that uh, should we view every species as potentially uh, uh, guilty here, or every genetic group, or are there particular places where we ought to focus our concerns? Okay, so um, let's see how to answer this. So certainly, you know, as I mentioned early on in the talk, the areas that have um, high pathogen diversity tend to be areas that have high mammal diversity. Um, and those tend to be tropical forests. So um, the, the, as, as far as I understand, the One Health CDC initiative is uh, part of their goal is to catalog these uh, zoonotic diseases. Um, and in terms of which taxa are most risky, um, you know, I, I, I guess I tend to think about it as um, not, not necessarily thinking about what, which animal is a risk to us, but rather uh, safeguarding ourselves by um, thinking twice about before penetrating into um, habitat that is occupied by a diversity of, of mammals in particular, uh, because of the, both the ecosystem services that this biodiversity provides to humans, but also because of the risk of uh, transmitting these novel pathogens. So uh, here's a question from Zach Hughes that I think asks you to put maybe a little finer point on that. It's, could you, I think what he's asking is, um, there's, you, you highlight two issues. One is reducing human presence in nature, and the other is um, protecting biodiversity. Uh, so are those two independent measures and given say people's interest in seeing animals and ecotourism is what's is there kind of a tension between those um hmm. yeah that's really interesting i hadn't actually thought about that yes that i would say there is a tension because um well it's a wicked problem how could there not be right yeah um you know i think i have a number of grad students who are working on um ecotourism is a, is a form of you know, sustainable livelihoods for people and, and wildlife around the world. Um, and, and it is a source of revenue for supporting many, many parks globally. Um, I think that rather than, I, I don't see it as black and white, this wicked problem is, is so wicked, so black and white, because I think we, we can still um, you know, support ecotourism. I think ecotourism in itself is not, um, high risk activity uh, if managed properly. I think we just, it, it's, it tends to be the ex extractive activities um, that, that um, cause, cause the jumping, the zoonotic jumping, okay. as and opposed to the ecotourism. In, again, in the spirit of discussion, there's a comment from Edward Yu saying that uh, um, there's, there's obviously a, a, a wide range of issues to support uh, uh, conservation of biodiversity, including um, uh, contribution of biodiversity to bio-based economies and the, the sort of basic principle that a decreasing biodiversity leads to greater homogeneity and we all know uh, what happens when you have monocultures in terms of um, vulnerability to uh, disease and collapse. So I want to um, move to a different couple of different types of questions and these I think get more at the transformational change uh, thing but the first one is is um, what about thinking about, so there, you've talked about zoonotic uh, diseases from wildlife. Uh, how does that balance against the threat from, um, uh, from um, uh, uh, industrialization of, 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 uh, of animal uh, consumption and production like swine and, 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 uh, and chickens and the we know those have been sources of influenza as well. So are those entirely separate problems that have to be de dealt with separately? 
uh, are the risks comparable? Um, would they both be under ZDC's jurisdiction? And then I'll yeah. just I'll lead on to the second question, which get, then gets to, you know, so should, how much how ought we all to just simply be vegetarians, and how much how important would that be for the uh, uh, for the for the type of transformation that you're looking towards? I'll answer the second one first because that's easy. Yes, we should all be vegetarians. Actually, um, are, I'm are not. You, are, can I ask you if you are? I'm, I'm not really, but, but no, I'm not really. Um, I try I to be two, better, you know. So. I have two kids, um, ages uh, 11 and 15, and they are both vegans. Wow. So for the most part in our home, we eat, we eat vegetarian, but you know, in principle, I, I occasionally will eat meat. My philosophy is not that. Um, you know, we have to be black and white about it. That you just be aware of our consumption patterns and eat less meat, basically, uh, is my answer to the to the second question. Um, I think that's a clear way where we can have an impact. And and certainly, you know, again, I focused a lot on governance, but as as individual consumers, um, just being aware of what we're consuming and where it comes from, and and trying to reduce our consumption patterns will have direct effects on addressing this biodiversity loss and risk of pandemics. Um, all of those hamburgers that you're, you know, ordering at the fast food place, ultimately there are beef cattle ranches somewhere. So getting at the first question, I might need you to rephrase it, Dan, but um, I understand, I understood you to ask uh, about the inter interaction between the threats to biodiversity and, um, and uh, also, the, the, the first one is really about uh, about zoonotic diseases, the balance between the extent to which uh, those are problems of uh, of wild animals and biodiversity versus problems of uh, industrial farming of of um, pigs and and uh, absolutely and thank you and I'm so glad you brought that up. It, it's equally a challenge in terms of the ch the transformative change that we need, the way that we are. Uh, the industrial farming and the way we're producing food is completely un unsustainable. Um, and there have been, I don't summarize it in this talk, but there have been a number of examples of outbreaks in industrialized farms um, that, that put us at risk. So I think um, another thing in terms of what an individual consumer can do is, you know, maybe you're a vegetarian, but, you know, when you're out in, say, Alaska and, you know, you're your friend catches, you know, shoots an elk, it's okay to eat meat, but in general, think about where the meat comes from and is it, is it harvested sustainably? So this, this isn't explicitly a question, but it does seem to follow on and, and you may not have quite taken your thinking there, but would ZDC's uh, jurisdiction then um, uh, expand to include uh, uh, the, the meat industry? I hadn't thought about it, but um, why not? Okay. <laughs> We have hegemonic ambitions here. Um, <laughs> all right, so. Uh, and, and I'll just say one thing. When thinking about this, you know, and looking through the, the many organizations, the, you know, Convention of Biodiversity, the CITES, the, you know, uh, WHO, et cetera, you know, all, all the work is good. This, all of those things that, that each of the organizations are doing is uh, productive. What I'm saying is, you know, the way that we aim to, for example, within the sustainable development goals, um, the sustainable development goal focused on biodiversity does not explicitly address disease. So I'm proposing that perhaps we need a separate organization that sort of liaises with all of these other organizations that may be more focused on disease or may be more focused on biodiversity, but we need something that synergizes and ex explicitly interfaces with these existing organizations. Um, that seems really interesting way to think about it. Now, um, here's another question about an alternative uh, approach to market driven, although it's from the, it, it still reflects uh, uh, economic incentive. This is from uh, Sushil Daswani. You early presented the drivers of zoonotic diseases. Wouldn't it be easier to tax those drivers, perhaps the WTO, in order to reduce their significance rather than try to stand up a global governance mechanism that aims to have kind of continual surveillance and shift the whole system? Uh, so in other words, why not selectively um, uh, make certain things unaffordable and, there, and, and in that way, um, 
in some sense, you're still using a, it's, it's a market-like mechanism. It's just you're increasing the price rather than trying to uh, put a price on. Yeah, I, I, I don't, um, I wouldn't argue with um, that idea. I think taxing is an excellent idea, whether that be manifest in a new governan governance regime or embedded within existing structures. The point is we're not doing it. So, you know, our, our collective question is how do we do it? You know, do, do we try to embed this in these existing structures or do we need to take a front throat, you know, start fresh and say, look, we need, we need an, an entity that focuses specifically on this risk, given, given the, the, the strong link to biodiversity decline. Okay, again, on the, the there, there's a number of questions still relating to the sort of the institutional questions. And I know that you've just begun thinking about this very big idea. So we'll consider all these kind of contributions to the discussion. This is from our colleague, Benedict Kalan. Um, and uh, she notes that it's really hard to create a new international organization, um, especially in the world as it is these days. Um, but that they're great places to demonstrate uh, what different countries are doing domestically and what policies do, do, uh, do work, um, a way of developing evidence, uh, places where you can run pilot programs and, and, and so on. Uh, so she, her suggestion simply is that um, it might be better to aim for programs within existing organizations like OECD, UNEP, uh, that, um, that build familiarity and evidence about new tools um, rather than trying to start with something from the, from, from the ground up. It's interesting, this is a debate that goes on all the time around uh, uh, the Office of Technology Assessment. Is, is it better to just put it in the, in the uh, Government Accountability Office or should we try to start up a new one? And there's always arguments on, on both sides. Um, but, uh, but certainly the difficulties of starting, of, of international governance might, I think as Benedict is suggesting, uh, might say that the path of least resistance would be to, to find um, some existing organizations. And, and if so, maybe I'll ask, where would you put your money? Oh, um, okay. So I, I agree with what you just said on um, maybe it wouldn't, you know, and, and it, to take immediate action rather than inventing a new organization, I see some logic to um, engaging with existing existing organizations. Um, in terms of where you know what I think is needed, I think you know even what you just were talking about that you know in other contexts this debate comes up about like do we start another organization or do we rely on it? Like that would be something we should look at. What what works? Under what context do we need a new organization? You know, this was a cursory look at, at this problem, but I think it would be, it would merit a deep dive into looking at that institutional governance question. Um, I think we also need to um, uh, develop an evidence base from which, and this is gonna cost money, an evidence base from which we can actually make predictions about what the relative impacts of different interventions or changes in land use uh, or policies might be for the disease risk. Um, so I think that's, that's what I would say is our number one priority in terms of um, tackling this. We, we need to start bringing evidence to decision making and that's the way to do it. Okay, I think I'll, I'll uh, maybe bring up one more question. This is a really big picture one. Uh, this is from Bob Zimmerman, who I've never met, but I'm sure is incredibly tired of having had to chase spend his life running away from jokes about who, what his real name is. Um, but uh, he says, it's not just Western societies eating less meat, but it's a collapse of fisheries in West Africa, uh, leading to more bush meat in the markets. In other words, I think his point is that everything's connected to everything else here. So, um, so we can't just think about it as a Western consumption problem. Uh, a more global problem than domestic meat consumption, loss of habitat in Africa, Asia, Central America will bring more exotic sources into the market. I think this gets at the tension, right, between the biodiversity pr protection and uh, the, the, the other interventions that you're talking about. But, but um, maybe what's being asked here is, is, uh, is loss of habitat really the big driver? Is that the thing that, that ought to be prioritized? And uh, uh, not that you should have to choose one, but sometimes um, uh, it's good to think about a place to start. So maybe, maybe that's the place I'll end is, is uh, 
you could focus on one thing that really was the place to, 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 to start making progress, what, what would it be? A, a really great question. You know, I listed in you know, the, one of the first slides what the, the primary threats to biodiversity are, and loss of habitat, land use change is, as I mentioned, the largest driver of biodiversity loss. So yes, I think that is the place to, to start. Um, I also think that managing wildlife trade is, is of an equal importance, but in, in potentially uh, less wicked of a problem because, you know, as, um, it, as has been pointed out in the, in the, the comments, um, we rely on this land for livelihood. So how do we manage land use change? Yeah. Um, so yes, land use change and uh, wildlife trade of, you know, those evil quartet, including introduced species, climate change, et cetera. I, I think the first step would be land use change. Although you do make a really interesting point about if you want to show positive change as a way to attract more support, maybe doing the thing that you can most do most easily, if that's intervening in the wildlife trade, maybe that would be the place to start. But yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so can I answer? Let, we have to start with both. Yeah. One, okay. is, one is low hanging fruit and one is wicked. Maybe, maybe we'll simply say this is a, the, 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 the beginning of an ongoing conversation. I uh, hope so. Yeah, so, so I'll wrap up here. Uh, you can all find uh, Leah, if you, Leah, if you want, um, uh, to continue the conversation. Uh, for those of you who find things uh, interesting and want to pursue them, you can also consider writing columns for us, uh, as Leah did. Um, the issue of uh, what evidence-based policy actually is and how to pursue it, we have a piece on that uh, on our uh, issues homepage today uh, that complexifies this discussion even further. Uh, so we hope uh, to keep you all engaged in these discussions. We thank you very much for your attention and especially Leah, thank you so much for your uh, provocative big picture, big think uh, column and uh, the conversation that it's begun today. And take care everybody and we'll see you next time.